people believe that the way to succeed is hustling and grinding. Um, I believe that there is definitely some merit in being diligent. Uh, well, there's a lot of merit in being diligent. Uh, the scripture says the hand of the diligent uh, beareth rule. It also says the hand of the diligent maketh rich. I think we should work hard because what, of what working hard makes us. It just makes us a stronger person. Um, it's like a person who goes to the gym and, and they, don't, they don't push the weights, right? They just go in there and play around. They're not going to get stronger. So hard work does make us a better person. But if you think that hard work by itself is the key to success, you are going to find yourself disillusioned at the end of a very long and arduous journey. So um, so when I say hard, um, success is easy after it's hard, I want to I bring your attention to a passage of Scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 10. And um, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon toward the end of his life. And the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes is... Um, basically, all is vanity and vexation of spirit if you live your life for life under heaven, right? So if you live your life for life under heaven, then for all, you only live your life for the things of this world, then you have wasted your life, basically, and made yourself miserable, okay? But um, this is Solomon, when he first comes on the scene, he loves God, he's yielded to God, he loves God with all his heart, he offers a thousand burnt offering, he's totally yielded to God, um, God wakes him up in the middle of the night and says, hey, Solomon, ask what I shall give thee. I've got you a, a blank check up here with your name on it. What you want me to make it out for? And Solomon said, um, only thing I can think of to ask is this. He said, he said um, the job that you've given me to do is bigger than me. I'm a little child. I don't know how to be a king. And he said, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me on this earth to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. That was Solomon's prayer. You talk about, and we were just recently had a conversation about kingdom, which we eventually will we'll broadcast on here. But when you think about the kingdom of God, Solomon's story is a perfect picture in the Old Testament of what it means to be seeking the kingdom. He said, dear Lord, give me the wisdom to do the thing you put me here to do in a way that pleases you and serves the people you put me here to serve. And as long as Solomon was yielded to the Lord, his life was blessed. But he... He made some mistakes along the way. He made some alliances that he shouldn't have made. He married a bunch of women that he shouldn't have married. And he let them turn his heart away from God. So in the beginning of life, Sol Solomon's life, he's yielded. In the middle of his life, he's, he's backslidden. And then at the end of his life, he repents. And he comes back. And um, when he comes back, he writes this book of Ecclesiastes. At the end of which, the last two verses of the book of Ecclesiastes is this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And keep his commandments. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing. This is the whole duty of man. What? See, fear God and keep his commandments. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, where Solomon is making, um, he's, he's, he's making an assessment of some things he's seen on the earth. Ecclesiastes 5, uh, 10, 5, it says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun. as an error that proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. The rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants on the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Verse 10 is the one I want to bring your attention to. It says, if the iron be blunt, that word blunt means dull. If the iron be blunt, he shall not and he do not wet the edge, wet means to sharpen, then he must put more strength. He must put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So what's he saying? He's saying the sharper your ax is, the less strength you have to put to chopping down the tree. He's saying take some time to sharpen the ax. Here's why people don't want to sharpen the ax, right? Because sharpening the ax doesn't bring applause. Nobody's clapping for you while you're sharpening sharp your axe. Nobody's cheering for you. Sharpen that axe! Sharpen that axe! I, you've probably never heard that cheer, right? And the re one of the reasons you've never heard that cheer is because axe sharpening is something you do in private. And, and Solomon is telling us that the work we do in private affects and impacts the work we do in public. He's saying, you're going to be much better off 
taking some time to prepare than you are just showing up to show out and perform. Everybody wants the praises of the crowd, but everybody doesn't want to prepare, doesn't want to, prepare to be the kind of person the crowd praises. I love to play golf. And one of the most fascinating things to me about the sport of golf, any golfers in here? Okay, so, cool. One of the most fascinating things to me about the sport of golf is that amateur golfers hit bad shots and act like they're surprised. <laughs> then they get all mad they hit a bad shot. <laughs> Hadn't practiced since three weeks ago. And you're going to act like you're surprised you hit a bad shot? If you want to be surprised and mad, be surprised and mad when you hit a good shot. Because <laughs> every time I see you hit a good shot, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all track him? And, and, and the difference between professionals and amateurs in any arena, professionals spend four times preparing, four times as much time preparing as they do performing. Amateurs spend four times as much performing as they do preparing. The people who become the elite athletes, the best in the world, the Michael Jordans, the Kobe Bryants, the Tiger Woods, they spend 10 times more time preparing than they do performing. It's, it's so amazing to me that authors will write books and get bent out of shape because nobody bought it. But the reason nobody bought it is because you didn't sharpen your ax before you wrote the last book. And they read it, and you've already let them know that what you wrote ain't no good. Sharpen the ax. Get better in private. Yes, sir. Study. It. So what's really interesting, this, this whole passage here, He's talking about a couple of things. One of the things, you'll notice he gives a couple of contrasts. He said, I've seen an evil upon the earth. In fact, I'm going to read it to you again just so you can see it. Uh, verse 5. Uh, I've seen, There's an evil which I've seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. What? Folly is set in great dignity? And he said, he said, folly is set in great dignity um, and he said, uh, the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Why? I believe he tells us the reason in the next verse. Here's what he said. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. There's risk associated with activity. You ain't doing nothing. There is no danger. Right? And so many people protect themselves by the, from the danger of the ditch by putting the shovel down. They're so afraid of the risk that they will never receive the reward. Wait a minute. That's not all he said. He said, he, said, um, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. There's a danger when you're trimming your hedges, especially here in Florida. Can I get a witness where my people were my people? Uh, right? That a serpent shall bite him. There's, there are unseen dangers in the work that we do, and if you're so afraid of the risk, you'll never do the action. Wait a minute, but he goes on. He said, he that removes stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. You're rolling stones. You might drop one on your foot. I had one of my business partners here a couple weeks ago, and he said, man, I said, and he was walking with a cane. I'm like, what happened, bro? I thought we were going to play some golf when you got here. He said, yeah, man, I had this 80-pound thing, and I dropped it on my foot and broke my foot. Right? All I'm saying is, it doesn't matter what work you do. It doesn't matter what kind of work you do. There's going to be some risk associated with it. He said, he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. And then he said, he said in verse 10, he said, if the iron be blunt and you do not wet the edge, he must put more strength to it. But watch what it says next. Wisdom is profitable to direct. Now, in order for us to understand, I'm going to go over to the board. I'm going to write some stuff down so y'all can understand when he says wisdom is profitable direct. We're going to see, we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at three areas that we need to sharpen our ax. Three areas that we need to sharpen our ax. But before I do, when he says wisdom is profitable direct, you have to understand the Bible says uh, get wisdom. Because wisdom, wisdom is the principal thing. So get wisdom. But like where do you go to get it? You go down to Walmart and say, well, you know, I'd like seven pounds of wisdom, please. No, that ain't where you get it. Get wisdom. Wisdom has some prerequisites. Pre meaning before, requisites meaning are required. So before you can have wisdom, there are some things that are required. I'm going to give you some of the prerequisites of wisdom. Prerequisite of wisdom number one is 
ignorance. Congratulations, you were born with that. And so was I. We were born into the world knowing nothing. Ignorance is a prerequisite to wisdom. Ignorance is, I'm going to make this smaller, wisdom is the absence of truth. That's ignorance. So we have to go from wisdom, I mean from ignorance, to knowledge. What's knowledge? Well, knowledge is the accumulation of truth. So I need to go around and start collecting some truth. When I was born, I didn't know my hand from my foot. I didn't know my eyes from my nose. And I'm sure one day when I was a little baby, I was just enamored by my hand. And I was moving it and looking, you know how babies do. And my mom said, that's your hand, baby, that's your hand. I said, huh, 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 huh. And I eventually learned this was my hand. What's that called? That's knowledge. And then I learned I have two hands. I got a right hand and a left hand. How do I know which one's my right hand, which one? And I got to learn that. Like, if, when we, can I encourage you? There are people say, I don't know how to use a computer. I don't know how to use technology. I'm not good at X, Y, Z. All you have to do is look in the rear view mirror of the knowledge you've already accumulated. That should let you know there's nothing you can't learn. Right? We want to make an excuse for why we don't. Like, if, if you don't know how to do something today, that's fine. But if three years from now, you want to know how to do it and you still don't know how to do it now, maybe we should come get your family and take them to safety. <laughs> because there's no excuse for not knowing three years from now. You can learn anything in three years. So, knowledge is the accumulation of truth. Three is understanding. What's understanding? Understanding is the assimilation of truth. And if I had knowledge about how to spell assimilation, <laughs> and maybe I spelled it right, I don't know, but it's assimilation of truth. So, so understanding, what does that mean? Now I comprehend the truth that I've collected. See, you can have knowledge without understanding. But you can't have understanding without knowledge. I remember when I, when I was, I think I was probably 21, 22 years old, there was this kid in the church that I went to, and he taught me how to play two songs on the piano. So I had knowledge of how to play the songs on the piano. I had no understanding whatsoever why those songs worked. I didn't know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the flats and the sharps and the half steps and the whole steps and the quarter notes. And the, I didn't know any of that stuff. I just knew if I put my fingers on these keys at this time, it's going to play this song. So you can have knowledge and not have understanding. I believe one of the biggest problems in churchianity today is that there are a lot of Bible-believing Christian people who know what the Bible says. They have Bible knowledge and no Bible understanding. And then lastly, after you get these three prerequisites, now you can have wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of truth. Wisdom is the application of truth. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means now... I know how to apply the understanding and the knowledge that I have. I know how to do something with it. So wisdom, the Old Testament word wisdom would translate into our modern day word skill. Now that, that, that should be exciting. Why? Why should that be exciting? That should be exciting because when I understand that if I want to have, if I want to have Success as an entrepreneur. I want to have success as a husband. I want to have success as a father. I need to make sure, number one, I need to make sure my mindset is right. But mindset by itself is not enough. We have to, I have to add to my mindset skill set. And when I add skill set, to mindset, now I've got something usable. Because when I add mindset to skill set, it's so interesting that only human beings do this. Like a beaver will build a dam. A bird will build a nest. A human being will build a tool that makes building a house easier. 
Why? Because we don't just have we don't have just instinct on building things. We literally will work hard at finding leverage so that when we work, we don't have to work so hard. See, Archimedes said, if you give me a lever long enough and a prop strong enough and a place to stand, I can single-handedly move the world. The problem with most people is they don't have a lever, they don't have a prop, and they have no place to stand. And so that lever long enough, prop strong enough, place to stand brings me to the last thing, which is a tool set. And when we add mindset plus skill set plus tool set, that equals assets and income follows assets. Here comes income. People, I promise you, if you're looking at your life right now and something's missing, it's missing because you either don't have the right mindset or you don't have the right skill set or you don't have the right tool set, therefore you have no assets and you have no income because you have no assets for that income to follow. It was a great day in my life back in 1999. It was, it was January of 1999. I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And when I read it, I realized for the first time in my life why I had been poor most of my life and why then I was middle class. And what I realized when I read that book is that the difference between poor people, rich people, and middle class people is not how much money they make. And it's not even how much money they have. The difference between rich people, middle class people, and poor people is what they believe the purpose of money is. Poor people believe the purpose of money is to pay bills. That's the primary purpose of money in the mind of a poor person, pay bills. So the only reason they go to work every day is so they can get some money on Friday and hand it over to somebody else. Middle class people think the primary purpose of money is to establish good credit so they can buy things they can't afford and pay it off over time. Rich people understand that the primary purpose of money is to turn it into more money. So I'm gonna take the money that I make, turn it into more money than I had, and then and only then can I be wealthy. I can only be wealthy if I hold on to my money long enough for it to get pregnant and have some babies. I wanna take every $100 bill I get and put it in the money maternity ward. That's the mindset that is necessary to develop the skill set of investing. Are y'all tracking? So as I think about sharpening, as I think about sharpening my sword, or I'm sharpening my ax, the first thing I have to do is I have to sharpen the ax in my head, which is wisdom. How do I, how do I sharpen the ax in my head, which is wisdom? Well, the scripture says this. A man, a wise man is strong, and a man of knowledge increases strength. What does that mean? That means a wise man is strong, but if a person has wisdom and they add knowledge to the wisdom, they're making their strength stronger. So I sharpen my ax, especially those of us who are teachers, pastors, evangelists, parents, business owners, thought leaders, this is, this is something that's so critical. Like if you don't do it, I promise you, you're gonna bump your head eventually and you ain't gonna be able to recover. You have to make sure you grow your learning faster than you grow your teaching. How do I sharpen my ax? I have to be more of a student than I am a teacher. And there, and there are so many folk out there in the world who wanna be perceived as thought leaders and they haven't read a book in three years. Like, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Thinking is the hardest work most people never do. We must be, let's, let's not be as infatuated with showing off the stuff we know as we are curious about learning the things we don't yet know. How do I sharpen my ax, Myron? How do I get better at chopping down the trees? How do I use less strength, less hustle, less grind, less work, less sweat, less toil? How do I do that? By strengthen, sharpening the ax of wisdom in my head. Because I add knowledge to what I already know, and I add knowledge to my skill set, and I get better at what I'm doing, and now it doesn't take me as long. Now it's not as hard. Now there's not as much toil. Now I've shortened the gestation period between seed time and harvest time. Because here's what, here's what God said in Genesis chapter 8, I think it's verse 22. Here's what he said. He said, as long as the earth lasts, 
summer and winter, hot and cold, seed time and harvest time shall not cease. So my job as an entrepreneur, this is so cool. I, I wasn't going to go here, but I got time. In Luke, I think it's chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, I think it's Luke chapter 8. Here's what it says. The children of this world are wiser when in their own generation than the children of light. How's that possible? Because the light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. How are the children of this? We have, a, we have the Bible. We have the word of God that has all of the answers. But we can't be bothered because our favorite show is on. We can't, we can't be bothered because we'd rather listen to music. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those. I'm just saying, like, we have to make sure we look, we're looking in the Bibles for order, in the Bible for orders from headquarters, not just a religious book that we tote with us on Sunday so people can think we're spiritual. And so the children of this world are wiser in their own generation than the children of light. Why? I think the key is in, the, in their own generation. One of the things, one of the things I've noticed as I coach entrepreneurs is the, one of the biggest reasons most people stay broke most of their lives is because most people are doing their best to earn a living in a world that no longer exists. What does that mean? Well, during the agricultural age, all of the wealth of the world was in the ground. Land equaled wealth. And the people who owned the land owned the wealth. And that's where we come up with the term, what, landlords. They were the lords of the land. What would they do? They owned the farm. They owned the land. If they didn't farm the land themselves, what would they do? They would let some poor peasants live on their farm. The peasants would do all the work, bring all the wealth of the farm to the person who owned the farm. Hmm. In the agricultural age, land equaled wealth. But guess what? Remember what I said a while ago, like, people build tools. We want to build some leverage so this work we do doesn't have to be so hard. So people started manufacturing tools to make the work they were doing on the farm easier. So the industrial age replaced the agricultural age, and the agricultural age created the need for the industrial age. Every economic era, era creates the need for the economic era that replaced it. And so what happened in, in, in agricultural age, like land equal wealth. If you own the land, you own the wealth. If you, if you were born into a family that didn't own land, you were born poor, you lived poor, you died poor. There was no chance in the world. Middle class... No middle class. There's either you're rich or you're poor. And whichever one you were, you were for your entire life. What a day to live in 2022. We think we got problems? Chow, please. In the industrial age, machines equal wealth. And the people who own the machines own the wealth. If you own machines, you could hire people and give them jobs, which would pay them more than they were making when they were working on the farm. And so now they had some leverage, and the middle class, the middle class was created in the industrial age which lasted up until about 1953, 1954. What happened in 1953 or 54? We started producing so much product, so many products in the world, that we had to have a way to distribute them. We had railway, railways that could take stuff from one side of the country to the other. We had all this stuff we produced, and now we had to figure out a way to distribute it. So the distribution age was born because of the industrial age. And in the distribution age, outlets equaled wealth. And what you'll notice, in the industrial age, people like John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, Dale Carnegie, these, these manufacturing moguls owned most of the wealth. And there were more wealthy people in the industrial age than there were in the agricultural age. And there are more people, wealthy people, create, wealth created in the distribution age than there was in the, in, the agri, in the industrial age. We had malls were created during that time, franchises, network marketing, direct sales, infomercials, um, um, uh, department stores, chain stores, all of that stuff was created during the distribution age. Why? Because we were manufacturing so, so much stuff, and, and we were selling it, now we got to find a way to get it to people, right? What happened in the industrial We started selling so much stuff during the distribution age, we had to have a way to track inventory, so Sam Walton came along, he said, you know what, I think I'm going to go recruit some people from IBM to create some software to manage my inventory for me. And so we went, we, went from the, we went from the distribution age in 1978 to the technology age. And then, now we got a way to manage this stuff. And then from that, from 1978, 1994, we went into the information age. 
1994, 2003, we went into the information age, and then in 2003, we came into what I call the techno info edutainment age, which is people who knew how to use technology to create information that would educate people in an entertaining way. Those were the people who owned the wealth. And people like Russell Simmons became a billionaire because he created a new music genre. People like, like uh, Jeff Foxworthy, who was a techno info edutainer. I want you to think about this. He was a dude who told you might be a redneck if jokes, but you know what he did? He knew where to find his, he knew where to find his target audience. Where? Truck stops. He started selling cassette tapes at truck stops. You might be a redneck if. He became so wealthy, he was one of the sharks on Shark Tank for a season. Why? Because he created his wealth in the economic era in which he lived. You want to create wealth? Use your wisdom, sharpen your ax to perceive that the best way to create wealth is to create wealth in the age in which you live, not in the past. What happened in 2008? 2003 to 2008, 2008, we came into a new economic era. This economic era has lasted longer than any economic era in history. What economic era are we in now? From 2008, still we're in it right now today. We are in the partnership age. Even multi-billion dollar corporations, you should look at Apple. Apple created the App Store in 2008. They created the iPhone in 2007. They created App Store in 2000. They said, if you will create content for our platform, we will pay you 70% of the profit of that product. We sell it to our customer base that we've already developed. What? You, Amazon said, if you will write a book and put it on the shelf, an e-book, and put it on our electronic bookshelf, we will email market your book to our clients and pay you when they buy it. Amazon pays me thousands of dollars a month for books that I wrote 2006, 2012. For ebooks, I've got zero cost in production. They send me 70% of the price of those books and they keep 30%. Why? Because Amazon realizes something people, like Amazon realizes something that your average ordinary entrepreneur no, doesn't realize. And that is 30% of a watermelon is a lot more than 100% of a grape. And so you have to sharpen the ax of wisdom in your head. That ain't all. It's amazing how all this stuff goes full circle, isn't it? You have to sharpen the acts of worship in your heart. Worship in your heart. Here's what the scripture says. Oh, wisdom in our head. Here's what the scripture says. Lord, watch what it says. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So the reason I'm supposed to be curious and learning as much as I can about as much as I can for as long as I can is because I know I'm dying. There is no wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Ain't that what it says? So I know I'm dying, so while I'm alive, I want to learn as much as I can so I can improve my life and the life of those around me as best I can. I'm sharpening the ax, but guess what? It doesn't matter if it's not yielded to God. If my heart is not yielded to God as the sovereign king of my life, that's how I prepare my heart to serve the Lord. Look, here's the deal. This, this wisdom that I get in my head is how I manage my way through life in dealing with all of the complexities of life. But my heart worship, you know the word worship? You know what the word worship means? It, it, it fascinates me when people use the term praise and worship as if they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. Praise is an outward expression that generally happens with my mouth. Worship is a heart condition. And it's, it has the same connotation as a dog that kneels down to lick its master's hand because it realizes that everything that it has is a result. It's a gift. Like when I am totally yielded to God, I understand I have nothing to be proud of but I have everything to be thankful for. Anything good I have is a gift. Anything I have is a gift. See, some of us have gifts we don't like because we didn't pick the gift. What? You ever give somebody a gift and say, well, yeah, that's all, and then they act like they didn't want it? Like, what kind of, what, 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 but it was a gift. Hey, guess what? Sometimes God gives us difficult gifts to make us stronger. 
I don't believe that God is the author of confusion. I don't believe that God is the author of disease. I had polio as an infant. I would, like, I've walked with a brace on my leg my whole life. I don't believe that God gave me polio, but I believe that he ordained that I have it. Some people say he didn't ordain it, he allowed it. God doesn't allow. In order for God to allow something, he would have to learn something that he didn't know, and he's always known everything. <laughs> and he knows the end from the beginning because in God's economy, there's no difference from the end and the beginning. Huh? It's a moving picture to us, but it's a snapshot to God. In time, there's no such thing as the present, but in eternity, there's no such thing as the past or the future. So what is has already been, and what's going to be has already been done. There's no difference. Okay, so what does that have to do with anything? So if God, in his sovereignty, saw that for the mission for which he created me, he ordained that the enemy give me an affliction so that when I get there, wherever there is, I'm going to be strong enough to stay there when I get there. See, an anointing, people talk about an anointing all the time, don't they? But people don't realize that an anointing is for an appointing. Right? If, there, if there's an anointing, there's an appointing. So, like, Samuel anointed David in the presence of his brother. And what's an anointing for? It reveals your purpose to you and those around you. Guess what happened? When you get anointed, when we get anointed, we, like, we lose patience, don't we? We're like, well, I just got anointed yesterday. I got anointed to be the king yesterday. Where's my throne? Somebody bring me my scepter. <laughs> that ain't how it works, is it? No. Joseph had a dream. He had a dream that all of his brothers, his mother and his father, were going to bow down to him. They wait, what? Just said, I had the dream yesterday. What y'all doing? Why y'all standing up? Don't y'all know I'm here? <laughs> the scripture says Joseph's brothers hated him for his dreams and for his words. Don't be surprised when people hate you for your dreams and for your words. Don't become disillusioned because people hate you for your dreams and for your words. That's what they do. When, when Joseph's father died, his brothers thought, oh, now he's going to get revenge. And they came to him and said, please, we know dad's dead now. We know you only didn't take revenge on us because, because, because dad was alive. But we're asking you, please, just have mercy on us. And Joseph said, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. You meant the thing you did for evil, but God meant the thing you did for good. That's why it's always a mistake to curse your curses. It's always a mistake to lament your lamentation. When you lament your lamentations, you curse your curses, all you're doing is showing that your heart is not sharp in worship because you're not yielded to the king who assigns you that thing. And an anointing is for an appointing, and as human beings, we want the season of anointing to come right after the season of anointing. And here's what God said. Eh. Wrong answer, but we do have some nice consolation prizes for you in the back. <laughs> Here's what God says. The season of anointing, or the season of appointing never comes right after the season of anointing. God has ordained that there is a season between the season of anointing and the season of appointing. It's called the season of disappointing. And the season of disappointing is the place where God gets you ready for what he already has ready for you. Don't waste time lamenting that you're not on the throne yet. You're not on the throne yet because you're not ready yet. You're not sitting on the throne of your assignment because God's getting you ready for what he already has ready for you. And when you look in scripture and you see people who sat on the throne and they had the anointing and then they had the appointing, but they didn't go through a season of disappointing like Saul. He got anointed. Next day, he's sitting on the throne. Guess what? He wasn't strong enough to stay there when he got there. He became a royal reject. God said, because you have rejected my word, I'm also going to reject you. We need to sharpen the axe of wisdom in our head, sharpen the axe of worship in our heart, and we need to sharpen the axe of work in our hands. We need to get better at the things we do. You know what's really interesting to me? We need to grow our learning faster than we grow our teaching, for those of us who are teachers. We need to grow our skill sets faster than we grow our assets. Because if you grow your assets, 
faster than you grow your skill set to handle those assets, eventually you're going to lose those assets. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying the easy hard principle is this. This whole thing about sharpening the axe. All of us in life have one of two choices. I can either let the axe remain dull and wear myself out chopping down a tree. Some of y'all feel really, really tired right now. And some of the reason you're really, really tired, I don't mean, I don't mean physically tired, I mean emotionally exhausted. I mean purposely, purposefully drained. And the reason you feel tired and like you've been working on this thing for so long and it's not working for you yet is because you've not sharpened the ax. You've not slowed down long enough. It's so so interesting that people will work hard at at what's not working so they don't have to think about what would work better. Won't they? Mm, I wish I had some help in here. (laughs) They will... It's amazing how people will maintain a state of physical diligence so they can maintain a state of mental laziness. The hardest work most people never do is thinking about what would work better. You say, Myron, what are you saying? Before you open your mouth the next time, take some time to read a book or two or three. Hey, the stuff you know, stop showing the stuff you know and go grow in the areas that you don't know. It's amazing to me. People think they can throw money at a problem and make it go away. Now, there are entrepreneurs. What they do, they get started in a business. They don't know how to do something, so you know what they do? They want to hire somebody to do it. But if you hire somebody to do something that you don't have any understanding of, you won't even know how to tell if they're doing a good job. When I, first started, when, when I first started this thing, I built my first website, my first website in 2005. I didn't have any idea how to build a website. I went to my brother, my brother Dwayne, and he's the only person on, God, on God's green earth I knew that knew how to build a website in 2005. I said, hey, bro, we can make all this money. I know how to do the marketing. You know how to do the technology. If we partner together, we can make all this money. He got mad at me. He told me off. He said, look, bro, you want to learn how to build a website, do what I did. Go to the church library, get Microsoft Professor Teaches front page, and, and learn how to build a website. I'm like, like, wait, 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 time out. We have a video in the church library about how to build. What, what's going on? I'm confused. I went and got those videos the next day. I started watching them. You know what took me 30 days to learn how to use Microsoft first front page to build a website? And if I showed you the website... Right now, y'all would laugh me off the stage. I'd probably laugh myself off the stage. Last time I showed it to somebody, I couldn't even stop laughing at how terrible it looked. And it took me two weeks of that month to figure out how to connect a merchant account processor and a shopping cart and a payment gateway. Like, I didn't even know what any of that stuff meant. And I had to learn all these new skills. Once I got them learned, then I had them. Now I can hire somebody and let them, I don't have to be great at it, but I need to know how it works before I go hire somebody. Sharpen the axe in your head and learn the things you don't know and increase your wisdom by gaining more knowledge. A wise man is strong, yet a man of knowledge increases strength. Sharpen the axe in your heart and prepare your heart to seek the Lord. God wants a relationship with man. God created creation and creatures, but he couldn't connect with them. He created man so he'd have somebody like him that's not him that he could connect with. And then when man severed that relationship, God contributed to man by giving his son to die on the cross for our sins. And now God has creation, connection, and contribution. We feel fulfilled when we have creation, connection, and contribution. Prepare your heart to seek the Lord. Don't have animosity in your heart towards other people. How can you say that you love God whom you've not seen if you hate your brother whom you have seen? Here's what God's saying. How you treat people is how you treat me. Wouldn't that be a good corporate culture? How you treat our clients is how you treat the owner of the business. Wouldn't that be a good corporate culture? How you treat the other people who work here is how you treat the owner. Wouldn't that be a good corporate culture? That changed the game, wouldn't it? Prepare your heart. Prepare your heart to seek the Lord. And lastly, prepare your hands. Develop new skills. Don't... It's really interesting. I'm, I'm going to be done. 
going to wrap it up. The very first thing God said to man was, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Be fruitful. Fruitfulness is something you become. It's not something you do. What does be fruitful mean? What is a fruit? A fruit is a living organism whose seed is in itself. So what does it mean when God says be fruitful? You may show up on the outside based on what I put on the inside of you. God put a different aspect of his creativity inside of all of us. That's the seed. We are supposed to make sure it shows up outside of us. That's the be fruitful. Multiply. You know what multiply means? It means to increase. You know what increase means? That means you're supposed to have more today than you had yesterday. Replenish means to fill up. Here's what that means. That means as human beings, our lives are supposed to be progressively productive. This today should be better than yesterday. This week should be better than last week. This month should be better than last month. This year should be better than last year. This decade should be better than last decade. If it's not, there's something in here that we're missing. Sharpen the axe in your head and gain wisdom. Sharpen the axe in your heart and worship the Lord. Sharpen the axe in your hand and learn some new skills that you can work with that will take your life to the next level. All right, my peeps. Stay blessed by the best, and by the grace of God, we'll look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday. All right. See you all then. Oh, by the way, before you go on YouTube, um, like the video, (laughs) comment on the video, subscribe to the video. I always forget to do that, right? Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you tell your friends. Make sure you smash the notification bell and all the other YouTube-y stuff y'all know how to do that I'm still figuring out.